Kia ora koutou. Um, so we are going to get started for session five now. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Nicola Kays. I'm from Auckland University of Technology and I am going to be chairing the session today. Um, so in this session, our speakers will be providing examples of um, some of the things that employers have been implementing um, to ensure safe, sustainable and supportive workplaces, reflecting on what's been working well, but also what we can further improve on. I'm really sorry to say that our first speaker, Matari Harwood, is not able to join us today. Um, she was going to talk about the critical question of how we might develop Māori responsive services. Um, and I think, you know, we have just heard the last panel respond to a question about equity, and I think our panellists in the last session just spoke beautifully to the need to be developing approaches which address some of the inequities in our system. And I think this is particularly true for, for Māori and especially true given our historical failure to, to really address the needs of Māori within our health and social services more generally. There was also an earlier question in the chat. I think someone asked about how we might learn from Maturanga Māori to inform a more expanded understanding of health. And I think that highlights not only can we be developing services to be responsive um, to Māori, but we can also learn from Te Ao Māori to um, enrich how we um, might go about developing service provision for all. And I think Mona touched on this in her response to the last question. Um, while we won't get to hear from Marjorie today, we're hoping that she'll be able to record a mini presentation for us um, and make that available after the fact. So when the recordings go up on the website, um, look out for her presentation, which hopefully we'll be able to make available to you then. So we're going to move direct to our second presentation for this session. Um, I'd like to introduce Tamara Dev, Dev Kitch, I'm really sorry, Tamara, I might have pronounced that terribly, um, who is the Health Safety and Wellness Advisor at Sistema Plastics. So welcome, Tamara. But no, my name is uh, Tamara Devsich, and I am the Health Safety and Wellness Advisor um, at Sistema Plastics. Most people in New Zealand um, would have heard of Sistema, and you will likely have some of our products in your home. Um, our products are designed and manufactured in our purpose-built facility in Mangere and exported to over 110 countries around the world. We have a team of over 700 employees, and although we think we're a large facility, I've been asked to speak to you from a small business perspective on how we responded to COVID-19. So firstly, a little bit about our people. Uh, so over 80% of our workers are Māori, Pacifica or other minorities, such as Indian or Filipino. A large percentage of our workforce live in the county's Monaco area, which was an area that was more highly affected by COVID. In fact, when we plotted our own uh, COVID case statistics um, against the Omicron outback, um, outbreak, it was almost a mirror image of all the positive cases in uh, County's Monaco. Some of our workers also have underlying health conditions, such as diabetes, heart conditions, or other high-risk medical conditions, or live with people who have these conditions. And this is something we were aware of pre-COVID and already had a selection of um, wellbeing initiatives in place. So our first uh, positive COVID case on site was in August 2021, um, but it was not until the Omicron outbreak in early 2022 that we were adversely affected by high absenteeism and impacted production. At the peak of the Omicron outbreak in March 2022, we had almost 40% of our staff off at once due to either having COVID or being a household contact of someone who had COVID. Throughout the whole pandemic response, um, we encouraged the early reporting of symptoms and positive results. Uh, everyone, was, everyone was encouraged to stay home and test if they were unwell and to keep us updated on how they were feeling. Uh, the re early reporting of symptoms also helped with our contact tracing processes and allowed us uh, to complete, the quick, uh, complete these quicker to potentially help limit the spread on site. Our dealings with the public health, uh, doctors, nurses and support people have also helped to guide us through the positive case process and helped provide clarity. This was especially helpful early on in the pandemic when as a business, we were still learning what dealing with COVID-19 looked like. Uh, their advice and information helped to guide our responses and the information we communicated to our people. 
We also developed a COVID safety plan which outlined how we manage the risks of COVID on site. And this, this was based on a risk assessment. Uh, the plan was developed in consultation with our employees through the Health and Safety Committee um, and union representatives and used guidance from the Ministry of Health, Public Health, uh, United Against COVID-19 website and, and WorkSafe. Uh, the plan was reviewed and amended as the alert level or traffic light systems changed um, or following any changes to um, the way that COVID was managed. Uh, we used the plan uh, for a basis for our training materials and a copy of the plan was posted up on the notice board so everyone had access to it. Um, so how do you uh, continue to run a business when you don't know how many people you'll be turning up each shift? So once we got our head around what um, the alert different alert levels meant to the business and um, we developed some implementation checklists for each level um, which outlined what needed to happen on site when we moved up or down a level um, and who was responsible for implementing the changes. Our operations and planning teams also had to be really flexible when it came to the jobs we were running and how we ran them. Uh, each shift we had to review and amend what we were running and how the machines were set up. Uh, as these were both dependent on how obviously how many people turned up, um, but also any physical um, distancing requirements um, that were in place. We also operated a, a vulnerable persons register, uh, which captured any employees or anyone in their household who might be at higher risk if they contracted COVID. Any vulnerable people were required to work from home if their role permitted. And if their role was not able to work from home, such as our factory workers, forklift drivers or engineers, uh, we provided special leave entitlements for them so that, that they were able to um, stay home when required. Our staff communications also played a big part in supporting the business during this time. We mainly used text message and email to communicate any changes to work or processes, and also used this um, for links to online forms to help, help us gather information. We found that our workers um, were also vulnerable to misinformation and disinformation. And by providing communication and information they could easily understand and read, um, really helped limit their um, exposure to this and re removed some of the fear and unease associated with COVID. Um, after our first uh, positive case um, on site, we worked really closely with the Ministry of Health to um, arrange an on site. Um, COVID vaccination event. Uh, we turned our delivery tunnel into a drive through vaccination centre and vaccinated our workers and their family and friends. Uh, the two vaccination events were a huge success and helped contribute to in increasing the number of vaccinated workers on our site. Our contact tracing was also a big job um, and to make that easier, uh, we used Safe For Me contact tracing cards. So Safe For Me cards are wearable contact tracing technology, uh, which stores information about who you've had contact with during a specific time. This helped us to easily identify any close contacts of positive cases, so we could quickly notify them of any potential exposure risk. So when our cases, uh, there, were, there were also many businesses um, who were nervous about what to do and how to manage a positive result. Um, so although we never claimed uh, to have all the answers, um, we were happy to share our learnings and best practices with other manufacturers. And um, we spoke to a handful of businesses about our experience, um, our experiences and talked them through the positive case process. And I believe uh, this helped alleviate some anxiety and helped them prepare themselves when they had a positive case. So when one of our workers um, does test positive for COVID, um, we looked at how we could support them to rest, rest and recover or to be able to support those in their household who needed them. So if the positive case works in a salaried role, uh, which is able to work from home, uh, the person isolated and work from home if they're well enough to do so. If they were too unwell to work, they use their sick leave, um, alternate leave, or um, we utilize the COVID leave support payment if no other options were available. For those waged, waged workers who've, whose roles were unable Able to work from home, uh, we utilised the COVID leave support payments um, to ensure they could stay home and either recover or look after dependents who were sick uh, without worrying about their wages and adding extra pressure to an already stressful situation. So we understand that um, every person's experience with COVID looks different. And although most of our people were able to return uh, to work normally, there are some who needed assistance to return to work and some who had or are still suffering from long COVID. Uh, we look at long COVID like we would with any other injury or illness and activate our return to work and rehabilitation uh, processes as needed.
Uh, the plans need to strike a balance between what the business needs to operate and what a person needs to enable them to complete meaningful work. Um, I found with my discussions with our staff with long COVID that they feel like they no longer have controls of their, control of their lives. Getting them back to work in some capacity gives them some sense of normalcy to the day and gives them back some control. And before we uh, develop any return to work plan, we always request information from their um, medical treatment providers. So we have an understanding of their current capabilities and any restrictions uh, we need to take into account. We also listen to what the person needs. Um, for example, we have one person at the moment who is um, currently on a long term, um, uh, sorry, long COVID uh, return to work plan who has uh, severe breathlessness. And she works on our afternoon shift. And when she arrives at work, uh, the car park is already relatively full um, with morning shift staff. And what she needed uh, was the ability and permission to use one of the, the mobility or pregnant lady car parks, um, which are close to the building entrance, so that she doesn't feel exhausted. Um, by walking from the other end of the car park before a shift even starts. Um, uh, the return to work plans also need to take into any uh, flexible working options, such as working from home, uh, staggered start or finish times or reduced days or hours. Uh, but the main, we found that the main need for this type of return to work plan um, is the ability for people to self pace their work and take additional uh, pauses or breaks if needed. Um, the speed of most of our tasks are dictated by the speed of the machines, and these are sometimes uh, too fast for someone uh, recovering from COVID. Uh, so we do have a self-paced uh, work area already in place, and these are reviewed uh, to ensure that they're set up with any additional equipment uh, that the person may require. Uh, the location of the work area um, in relation to the facilities also needs to be reviewed, um, especially if they need um, you know, access to break rooms or bathrooms um, and that they're easily accessible. Um, and lastly, we also have other um, services available to workers if they need them to support their return to work. Um, so we have an um, employee assistance program where they can access mental health support um, and an on-site physio uh, who can assist with task assessments, um, exercises or strengthening programs to continue to support recovery. So, um, the way we rehabilitate people back to work uh, will continue to change and evolve the more and, and with the more we learn about long COVID um, and its effects. So thank you for the opportunity uh, for participating today and thank you for listening. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tamara. Um, such um, great practical examples, I think, of what sounds like a, a highly agile and responsive workplace. So um, thank you for sharing those examples. Next up, we have two presenters, um, each join five minutes each, and both from Batu Ora Tananaki. Um, so we're going to start with Fee Dunford, I think, and then we'll be moving on to Rachel Grady, who are going to share um, some of the work that they've been doing in Taranaki. Thank you for this invitation to speak today. I acknowledge my Te Whata Ora Taranaki colleagues, the patients from whom we learn and collaboration with the Physio New Zealand Cardiorespiratory Special Interest Group who continue to advocate and develop resources in this space. Research for our service commenced late 2020. Guidelines were developing overseas and allied health was championed in delivering care. By January 22, male and female staff were being treated by physiotherapists and occupational therapists on an ad hoc basis, such as in dining halls, in lifts and stairwells. And many of us were supporting colleagues online. Private practice colleagues were signaling increasing demand from those who understood about COVID rehabilitation programs, thus raising equity issues. A straw poll in May 22 identified increasing referrals to our services, yet case numbers were hidden without formal coding. Now, seven months on, we celebrate a team dedicated to make their journey through the fog a little easier. Our cohort were previously fit and well, they were not hospitalized and it expected to have recovered just like everybody else. Many were worried. There was measurable impact on career, life and relationships. Many had discovered a whole new level of fatigue. Further complicated by a linear model of return to work, a cohort working in masks all day and a depleted healthcare workforce and the healthcare culture of pushing on regardless of symptoms. These staff were medically aware and Google had exhausted their tolerance for self-help strategies. Some understood about allied health working in this space and had sought help working in the private sector. Collaborations with overseas teams taught us much about the workings of long COVID clinics. 
this BMJ update for primary care is most useful. We base our clinic on a similar tier model to that used overseas and the foundations on what is considered to be the gold standard. My thanks to Lauren Piercy, our occupational health CNS reporting that there are 2,532 employees in Te Whata Ora Taranaki. By February 23, there have been 2,618 positive results accounting for reinfections. Long COVID's long COVID prevalence modeling suggests that over 200 staff could present with post COVID syndrome and therefore profit from our service. Thus far, 97 staff have required occupational health input. And since January 22, the clinic has evolved and now uses two tools to determine A, impact, and B, symptoms, which steers the course for care. The post COVID-19 functional status scale or PICFA scale measures disease impact from zero to four, adapted by Alberta Health Services from original work by Clock et al. It directs potentially overwhelming numbers of referrals to a finite resource. A PICFA score of two is considered case by case, whereas a score of three or four generates a referral choice requiring opt-in consent to be forwarded to the Allied Health Long COVID Clinic. The Long COVID symptom map is our patient's voice, directing those who need support to the most appropriate health practitioner. It was developed and trialled in Taranaki, now located within the Ministry of Health guideline documents. It captures symptoms, function, offers a body chart and a narrative space. It is a time saver as it directs patient care to the appropriate allied health professionals and supports red flag recognition. It continues to evolve and factors highlighted on the map are supported in the Delphi Consensus Survey by Mundlet et al in July 22. This slide represents the process of referral from occupational health to the Allied Health Clinic. Occupational health continue to work with all staff regardless of the path taken and Allied Health provide professionally scoped support where required. The Allied Health Staff Clinic uses a two tier model. As per overseas strategies, the model of care is one to one. Tier one in blue represents the management options and care relationships with valued support from our cardiologists. Tier two in green represents other key allied health professions who are involved in an advisory capacity with an option for referral if initial screening suggests their expertise is required. They provide resources such as screen tools and handouts to support the tier one professionals. For those of us involved, validation, empowerment with knowledge and practical symptom management leads to successful outcomes. We are using validated tools to demonstrate effective change and we're lodging those into a database and that's growing. In the interest of time, these reports from the users of our service were important, we felt, to show. This service was formed with existing resources and from the ground up, we continue to advocate for funding and national guidance as the development and planning has largely been completed in therapists' own time, voluntarily. This is our vision. These are my references, and I hand over to my colleague, Rachel. Thank you, Sorry. Katoa, for Rachel. Oh. I feel very privileged to be the occupational therapist working as part of the long COVID team, caring for our colleagues at Te Whata Ora Taranaki. Building on Fai's background to the development of our service, I'd now like to share some examples of the clinic's input with an emphasis on the work-related components. For the service to be effective and to support and complement the work that our occupational health colleagues were already providing, we needed to develop new shared ways of working and understanding of each other's roles and the professional scope. Anecdotal feedback was coming in that GPs were finding it difficult to know how to navigate work capacity and identify work readiness. International best practice indicated that efficacy was improved if single discipline input occurred sequentially to prevent flooding from multiple inputs. And this required a shift from our typical multidisciplinary rehab models where inputs occurred concurrently. And we needed to develop effective symptom prioritization and the identification of which speciality input occurred at which time. By the time a referral to the long COVID clinic was received, colleagues had usually already experienced periods of self-management, occupational health support, and many had a return to work plan in place but they needed additional support. They may experience complex symptom profiles, significant functional impacts and barriers to successful work plan. The opt-in service was designed to be as accessible as possible. Time spent at appointments was counted within the work plans. It was paid 
and it could occur on or off site. To establish therapeutic trust and maintain boundaries, clear communication channels were established. Feedback from the team was direct to the referrer who were occupational health. They retained responsibility for communication with managers and human resources. They formulated and modified the work plans, but were responsive to the feedback and recommendations from the clinicians. Exploration of practical and attitudinal barriers to the implementation of the strategy was a keystone to change and success. Commonly identified barriers were the high expectations people had of themselves that exceeded their current capacity, their loyalty to their clients, to their colleagues. And it was in a background of a depleted workforce and a healthcare culture of caring for others and putting others first. The overall sustainability of work plans was very important. We were trying to avoid a repeat sickness absence return to work cycle and education to signpost potential pitfalls and strategies to navigate transitions and progressions in the work plans were identified as highly vulnerable times for people. The individual's ability to adhere to a work plan were impacted by complex extrinsic and intrinsic factors, both occurring at home and at work. Work plan considerations required a supportive and a pragmatic personalized approach one size did not fit all. The creation of work plans utilised accommodations and alterations commonly adopted in existing vocational services, but with long COVID due to the unpredictable and fluctuating nature, the alterations and accommodations necessary often needed to flex and alter over time. The typical linear graduated work plans with structured dated increases, set hours to be worked, held the risk of locking the employee in to targets which must be reached, irrespective of symptom fluctuations. In order to achieve these rigid work plans, it was necessary to adopt strategies which were contrary to the best practice strategies for symptom management and recovery in long COVID. And an inability to meet these targets could be interpreted as failure. We're learning more about doesn't, what doesn't work well for these complex people. And our colleagues are feeding back to us about what they are finding to be effective. We're recalibrating the expectations and we're finding that fatigue management is of extreme value. Slow, highly flexible work plans seem to be extremely important. We would like to see further expansion of services, both locally and nationally. And we are very grateful for the current opportunity to make just a small contribution to our colleagues and their recovery journeys. On behalf of Fi and myself, thank you for your interest and attention today. Kia ora. Thank you so much both. I think that is just actually such a wonderful example of, you know, the switch when you're caring for colleagues who routinely are the people who are caring for others, um, but also the challenges of um, trying to implement best practice in, in a real world environment. So thank you for sharing those experiences. Next up, we have Nicola. Um, Nicola Emsley um, is a doctor from Middlemore Hospital who specialises in occupational medicine. I'm going to hand over to you, Nicola. Um, well, thanks for the opportunity to speak. It's really great to be here. My name is Nicola Emsley. I'm an occupational physician. And probably a lot of you don't know what an occup occupational physician is. Um, in very basic terms, it's a specialist doctor who has an interest in the impact of health on work or the impact of work on someone's health. So I work at Middlemore Hospital and we have an occupational health clinic here at Middlemore um, and I cover the employees of the county's Manukau district. So when we have somebody come to see us with long COVID symptoms, and what I'm talking about here to be clear is staff that work for counties. So they may be doctors, nurses, physios, orderlies, cleaners, radiologists, engineers, all sorts of people that work within the hospital system can all come and see us in the Oak Health Clinic. Um, so somebody who may come and see us with long COVID symptoms, they may refer themselves to our clinic uh, or they may be referred by a manager. And we're really lucky that we have the privilege of long appointment time. So actually an initial review is an hour, which is a great period of time to be able to really understand what's going on for an individual to know okay what symptoms are they dealing with because everybody has different symptoms there are some similarities but long COVID affects different people in different ways what's going on with their general background health 
what are the specifics of their role within the hospital because um, it's really important to understand what the actual task requirements are both physically and cognitively in their role what are their home demands um, and what are their supports like in their home environment what's their relationship like with their manager and with their colleagues is a generally supportive work environment and of course these conversations I'm having with people are always absolutely confidential so I hope that they feel that they can be quite open about what's really happening for them and that if there are difficulties with their relationships at work that they can be open and honest about that because that's something we need to take into account. I want to know what aspects of work worry them when they imagine coming back to work are there particular tasks or responsibilities that they think I just don't know that I can even go near that yet. You also have to consider, of course, the safety aspects. You know, these people are delivering care to patients, and so you need to make sure that you've covered off the safety side of things adequately. And also checking in around mental health and how they're coping with what can be a really challenging diagnosis. So when an individual is ready to begin a, a graduated return to work plan, we work on that collaboratively, and we do it in a stepwise manner. And it's a flexible plan, as many people before me have already talked about. And the follow-up is really regular. So initially, I'll, I'll follow up with them every couple of weeks. That'll be a 30-minute appointment. And rather than necessarily bringing people into clinic, that can be by Zoom or phone, just to help with kind of energy management. And I like to take some time um, with these individuals to really help them understand what to expect. And first up, uh, reassure them that they are not alone. They might not know anybody else who's suffering from long COVID and they may feel really isolated. So letting them know, you're not alone. I've dealt with other people with long COVID. And, you know, many of them are, are well on the way back to work. Some of them are building up their hours really beautifully. And, you know, I'm going to support you as best I can to do the same. We talk about the fact that symptoms fluctuate a lot. And I think I'll go through the slide quite quickly because it's been covered very well by other speakers. But the importance of pacing and rest to expect some energy crashes, but to try and avoid them and learn about how to pace and how much you can do before you've gone too far. And that's really difficult. Um, reassurance that people are not going crazy. Uh, they haven't got early onset dementia. What they're experiencing is brain fog and that it's actually quite a, a common symptom of long COVID. And I don't mean to sound flippant by that because you know a number of people I've dealt with have been really quite frightened by the brain fog and felt really reassured that this was actually a normal symptom of a, you know of this condition, a normal symptom. But yeah, um, and really the need to prioritise their health and recovery. A lot of these people really want to be back at work to serve their community and actually feel guilty about not being at work, and just emphasising that right now is the time to focus on their own health and recovery. And then the importance of educating managers as well. Um, so explaining how increasing hours or duties too quickly can actually be counterproductive. Um, and really emphasizing the fact that a lot of these individuals are putting a huge amount of pressure on themselves to get back to work really quickly and build up their hours really quickly because they might be worried about um, their job security, they might feel dreadful that they're, you know, letting down their colleagues, that their team is already short-staffed and then being off is putting extra work on other people. They may feel that they're not necessarily really believed. Um, so for the manager to provide reassurance is huge. Um, and also for managers to understand the way that symptoms fluctuate. So someone might be back at work and they may have done two days in a row where they seem to have great energy. That doesn't mean that the long COVID is gone and the person is, is cured, they may have a bit of a crash the next day and that the trajectory of recovery is not this beautiful linear predictable one. There are ups and downs. And so that flexibility is really important. And that everyone's different don't compare to different people with long COVID. They may have completely you know, different recovery courses. That's likely. Uh, also education around um, energy that, of course, it's not just physical exertion that uses up energy, but also cognitive and social energy, getting to work, finding a park, walking into the ward, talking to your colleagues, that could be enough for some people that could have drained their energy for the day. So being flexible where the job allows to have some days working from home can save a lot of energy expenditure. Where that's not possible and a person does need to come on site, looking at reducing the hours, reducing the tasks that they're required to do so that it's more manageable. I found that being quite specific on the return to work guidance is helpful both for the individual and for managers. 
but with the caveat that the plans can always be adjusted up or down, but at least it gives people something to hang their hats on. So this might be an example for, say, a social worker um, returning to work when their symptoms allow them to come back to work. It might say that for the next two weeks, I recommend you work three days a week for up to five hours, do morning shifts, have a day at least working from home, avoid the big MDT meeting that's overwhelming and um, is very cognitively demanding, um, assist with your established clients, don't take on new ones because again, that's really cognitively demanding. Flexibility, don't feel guilty about having regular breaks, about finishing early if you need to on some days. And we're gonna review it in two weeks and I'm gonna provide updated advice to you and your manager at that time. Um, and I think people have found that really useful. And then finally, I want to touch on some lived experience on some of my lovely and generous patients. Um, so this first person um, is someone who's not back at work yet, but I'm working with them and that's absolutely the goal. She says, I was blessed. My boss assured me I had a job. Uh, I'll just move this. Um, and knew I was working on recovery and to take time to heal. And that took a lot of stress off. She says, you long to be at work and you beat yourself up daily about letting anyone down. In a normal situation, you would just push through and go to work, but with long COVID, you physically cannot. And if you try to do something beyond your level, you can feel awful afterwards for days. So that's a real example of that post-exertional malaise. Um, my second person is back at work on reduced hours and reduced tasks. And she says that supportive, man uh, supportive managers made a huge difference. And also um, that decision-making is really difficult when you're unwell. And so having somebody objective who can provide guidance around the work hours and tasks and has your best interests at heart has been really helpful for her. Uh, this third individual was also back at work and back to full-time hours, but still with some flexibility built in for some work from home. And she says, prioritize. The house may not be tidy. You might not have worked your usual hours, but that's okay for now. And to have small daily goals, which you can build on over time and that it's useful to keep track of your progress because often it's so gradual you don't really notice it. Uh, don't worry there's just five of these so this is the fourth one. Um, again this is someone who is now back at work full-time hours but still with some flexibility in place. She cautions to watch yourself talk because it can be very easy to get into a negative spiral to avoid alcohol and highly processed foods to take a break before you become shattered and that pacing is just so important, but a really difficult skill to learn, really hard. And that scrolling social media is not a real break. And then finally, this individual is not yet back to work, but again, absolutely that's our goal and, and she is improving over time. And she comments that small wins add up over time. Um, and to compare how you were at the start of having long COVID rather than how you were before long COVID and that it's really helpful to have a good network of people you can vent to when you're feeling frustrated. And what she really wanted managers to understand is that long COVID may not be visible. So please actually you know, ask people how they're affected and what you can do to assist and support them. And so finally, I just wanted to acknowledge and thank my lovely patients who shared their helpful advice and to everyone involved in today's event. It's really important work. So you know, I appreciate you being here and also to healthcare workers for everything you do for our communities through the pandemic and now in a time where we're chronically short-staffed and people are working so, so hard. You're really appreciated and thank you so much. And thanks for your attention, everybody. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nicola, and thank you for sharing um, the range of examples and experience. Um, I think it's useful to have kind of the diversity of, of um, practical advice that we can all learn from. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to Ben Chust, who is our next speaker. Ben is Chief Executive of Habit Health, um, physiotherapist by background, um, who has worked in the voc rehab industry for many years um, and is going to share some of his insights with us today. Great. Inga Matawaka o te motu tēnā koutou katoa. He kai whakahare matua hoki Habit Health, me EAP services, ko Ben Chust tōko ingoa. Uh, so great to hear all the other presentations earlier today. I think that there's some um, wonderful things to take from these, some big sticking uh, things that stick in, in my mind from them uh, around how different everybody's experience is. And I think that that's one of the biggest things to start with here is that every presentation that we see um, has a has different factors to it. Um, and so we, we really do need to treat people as individuals. 
So just a little bit about Habit Health and EAP services to start to familiarise you with what we do around the country. Um, we are a large allied health workforce. Um, you can see all the professions there, um, over 800 staff, um, many more um, network partners across the country that help us deliver this type of work to over 6,000 employers. So employers that don't um, have the internal resource uh, like the likes of Nicola. Um, uh, and then we're working with ACC and directly with individuals as well. And just want to uh, recognize the amazing staff that are out there every day um, supporting people in the community so that they can optimize their health and live their best life, even in the face of uh, long COVID. So we uh, work with 6,000, a little bit over 6,000 employers, actually represents over 1 million individuals across the services um, throughout New Zealand. And one of those services is vocational rehab. So I just wanted to touch on exactly what we mean by vocational rehab. Um, so interdisciplinary team support, meaning basically anybody that is needed to help return to work. And what it involves is assessing these job tasks from a physical, a cognitive, and an emotional um, perspective, um, and sometimes taking on a whole lot of pre-COVID factors as well that are, have, have then become more of an issue, sometimes less of an issue, as a result. We identify the barriers, the limitations, and the opportunities, have to highlight that there have been some opportunities as a result of long COVID. We've actually had some clients who have had promotions that have accommodated their tasks and, and actually resulted in a better outcome. We form a plan. Um, you've heard a lot about these different plans. Then it comes down to the implementation, the monitoring and the fine tuning. So um, we've all heard so far today that um, it is not a linear progression scenario. P to success. So again, um, if you take anything away from this today, I want you to take away engaging early. Engaging early is such an important factor when what we see, um, we've heard a lot from people who have tried to push through um, uh, and engaging early in a vocational rehab process is absolutely essential from, from our view. So Returning to work after rec recovering um, from COVID-19 can be challenging itself. And for those with long COVID, um, they will experience symptoms such as fatigue, shortness of breath, brain fog, muscle and joint pain. And these symptoms all affect the individuals differently because they have different jobs and because they're individuals themselves. So it's essential really that employers, and I really call out for any employers that are on the call today that aren't doing return to work programming um, that's been already dis, um, described to actually take this up. Um, so accommodation is really a, a really key part of these plans, modified duties, um, remote hours, ergonomic equipment, change in process, um, they all make a very big difference to what we're doing. Effective communication is the other really key thing. And what I think is, is important here is that we're bringing all parties together to understand the situation. And so it's not just us sitting with the client and describing um, and, and understanding the presenting or challenging factors. It's working with the employer um, in multiple levels of the employer, as well as sometimes colleagues as well. So education across the workforce is really important. Health and wellness support um, is also essential um, in why we, we have tried to merge EAP services in alongside some of our vocational rehab programs. So it's really important that workers will have access to physiotherapy, mental health support, nutrition, wellness resources, cultural support, and really anything else that may be forming a barrier. Um, we have in fact, and a lot of financial advice through EAP services to help people in some situations where they're simply not able to work their normal hours. So there's quite a lot to say around the ecosystem of health with its application to long COVID. So we like to look at an employee journey where we're typically working with um, employers and employees. And so we need to consider this whole wellness ecosystem as we go along. So Within the context of COVID-19, um, uh, there are a huge number of factors or complexity components that we've heard about already today. 
maybe a different way of looking at that is like a tiled mosaic wall. So a, a wall of hundreds of tiles. And each of those tiles can be different factors that on different days shine or, or, or are less prominent than others. And that's how that individual is feeling or how those individual factors are, are factoring into their day. And that's the unpredictability of, of long COVID as well. So quite a nice way of thinking about it. When we look at that whole system, we really need to think about the importance of understanding the individual's view of what's wrong too. And so there is a huge amount that is, is down to what the individual believes um, is important, what the goals are, what the barriers to success are. Only then with this model will you succeed. Um, and uh, as Paul said earlier, um, absolutely agree that our approach and what we do to long COVID is not actually too dissimilar to the likes of return to work after concussion, um, pain management presentations, um, compl complex um, multi-injury um, site return to work. There isn't a recipe. In fact, it's much more of an art. Um, and so thinking of it like that is quite important. So similarly, I've got a case study, um, just one to, to really highlight kind of the, the types of programs that we'll put together. So in this case, uh, the client was diagnosed with COVID-19 in July 22, um, and had, when they presented to us, had six months of persistent chest pain, um, nerve pain at a previous surgical site, fatigue, breathlessness, cough, and poor sleep. They had a complicated medical history as well, um, uh, and at their first appointment, they were working three hours a day, so from nine till 12, and at that point, fatigue meant they had to go home, have sleep. Um, they also reported that poor exercise um, tolerance um, with really elevated heart rate, breathlessness, chest pain, um, and extreme fatigue as soon as they tried to push through that, um, uh, that exercise barrier. So in terms of what we did, well, pacing advice and education for home and work was really, really key. So I've underlined the and, um, similarly to others, we have to look at the whole person and we cannot just look at a work context. So what people are doing at home is absolutely essential to work and vice versa. In this case, we spent a lot of time educating on energy systems of the body. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about heart rate uh, was linked to breathing rates and how people were breathing and, and, and all of these sorts of things. We actually had dietitian input in this case as well, which is a little bit unusual. Um, and the focus here was on fatigue and decreased physical activity. Um, Exercise planning was very, very important for a periodized plan. And in this case, uh, it was very much about holding the person back from the normal activity levels that they would have had pre-COVID and educating about how they linked to those work demands. The biggest thing, though, with this, with this client was that we focused on breathing techniques. And breathing techniques, advice and education formed actually one of the largest pieces of this program. And the goal was to be able to return to work without the breathlessness, to be able to maintain talking while standing. So presentations was very, very important here. And that meant that they would be able to present confidently. So in terms of the return to work plan, we actually didn't change any hours to start off with. So they were working three when they came to us um, and they continued to for, for quite some time. The first step, after we had gone through the breathing exercises and relaxation techniques was that we actually worked to remove the afternoon sleep. And we replaced that afternoon sleep with the breathing exercises and relaxation techniques, which for this individual meant that they actually reported feeling more energized rather than more foggy after their sleep. The next phase was introducing the addition of light afternoon activity. Now, this was more work, uh, not work, sorry, home tasks. Rather than going out for a run, it was very much about um, home tasks. And we focused there on balancing the increasing work hours and the exercise tolerance. So they had to be viewed as a grouped program. Once we were progressing there, we then moved the breathing exercises to standing. Um, so very much about simulating what we were trying to achieve with a focus on controlling breathing while talking. 
And at eight weeks after entering the program, um, we had achieved almost full-time work. So after six months of not being able to do that, um, almost um, very close. The employer, again, has been very accommodating and we're back to full pay, but we're not quite back to that uh, full hours. But well, I think that we'll be there. So just to, to um, wrap up here, in terms of action points um, and really focusing on employers, as I say, recognize that return to work with COVID-19 or long COVID and other presentations is complex. Um, you cannot take what you have done with one employee two months ago and replicate that with the next when they present with the symptoms. Engage early. I can't emphasize that enough. I'd like to highlight vocational rehab for employers. You have a irreputable uh, return on investment. 90% of people are achieving a return to work, so it is absolutely a, a wonderful thing to do. And then combining that with EAP services and a wellness um, and movement focus um, will give not just those that, that you're working with, but your whole workforce a, a positive benefit. So by working together, employers and employees can help ensure a safe and successful return to work with for those with long COVID um, and really encourage you to reach out to, to access those services in the community. So thank you. And um, back to you, Nick. Awesome. Thank you, Ben. Um, I think um, often we can um, have this distinction between um, a health response and a vocational response, but I think you've just provided some really great examples of how employers can, can draw on the support of voc rehab providers um, too, um, for the benefit of their workforce, but also of their business. Um, so last but not least in this session, we have Richard um, Kiplin, who is going to be joining us from the Financial Services Council. Richard is the Chief Executive Officer of that organisation and looking forward to hearing what you have to share with us today, Richard. Kia ora, everybody. Uh, uh, Richard Kiplin is my name. I'm really delighted to be here and commend uh, the organisers, a uh, really important conversation and topic. Nick just wanted to confirm that um, everyone can see the slides. Fantastic. Um, so su such an important conversation. And um, um, I thought in this conversation, I would just um, uh, give you a sense of who the Financial Services Council is and who our members are. Um, obviously, the topic of the discussion is around the art uh, and science uh, for the life and the health insurance sectors. So I'll just paint a little bit of a picture on there and just give you a little snapshot of the journey to date. Um, so look, the Financial Services Council is the peak body that represents the life insurance sector, health insurance sector, the Kiwi Saver sector, the funds management sector, and we do a lot of work as well in the financial advisory sector. So that's kind of who our members are. What we're most interested in as an organization is helping to grow the financial confidence and well-being of New Zealanders. So we take a very community-centered approach to this. And obviously, um, uh, you know, on the investment lens, markets, uh, you know, rise and fall the last three years has been really really difficult for everyone in the community uh, and our sector kind of faces into the life insurance risk and the health insurance risk obviously with COVID uh, and then as Ben said as, I, as I'm sure many have said today um, living in Auckland um, you know the floods the earthquakes uh, the cyclone you know these are risk issues which kind of face into all of us every single day and as a sector we are very interested to figure out how do we help Kiwis actually think about these issues so that they can actually understand the risk and mitigate the risk and manage the risk and so on. And sometimes when the risk occurs, um, have people uh, got the mitigation, the right mitigation uh, piece in place, whether that's their self-insurance or they've actually worked with a life or a health insurance company to manage it. So just to give you a sense of the overall stats across the country, on the left-hand side of the screen, um, these are this is data to the end of June 22. Um, in the you know, there are a, a roughly uh, 5.2 million Kiwis. Um, as at then, there are 4.1 million life insurance covers. Now, life insurance is life insurance, it's also income protection insurance, trauma insurance, TPD insurance. People who are well covered will obviously have multiple covers. So, don't think about the 4.1 as individual people covers. 
if you take my example, I've got four different covers, so I account for four of those uh, in the mix. The total annual premiums into the sector are just under 2.9 billion and claims uh, of about 1.2 uh, billion. So you know, insurable events happen, I guess, is the message um, uh, out of that. And so, you know, those 4.1 million covers of people who kind of thought about the, if if things happen, how will I manage? How will I cope? Um, in terms of the health insurance sector, uh, 1.18 million customers um, with about 1.85 billion of uh, uh, annual premiums and about 1.39 billion of claims paid also for that same period to June. So we're talking about material and substantive numbers here of money into the system of people covered. Obviously, the health insurance system works very closely, both the private working alongside the public system. Uh, and we spend a lot of time uh, working uh, with government and semi-government agencies to make sure that it's as frictionless as possible. You know, the the, the world of insurance and the world of life in, and health insurance is about managing and pricing risk at scale. Um, and so, uh, in order to do that, clearly we need uh, things around experience, and so any uh, any illness or sickness uh, is uh, is done at scale. And you know we've got uh, obviously actuarial based uh, data that goes back a long, long time, so we can actually price it so that when a customer or a potential customer wants to take our particular cover, we kind of understand at a sector level what's the risk and what's the possibility. I think obviously as well, um, uh, most people would understand that before life insurance is offered, people need to fill out uh, a range of uh, personal and medical questions, otherwise known as the personal statement, and those are all each uniquely underwritten. Um, and so the, the challenge in COVID and long COVID is it's so new and the uncertainty is so high um, and uh, there's a lot of knowledge that we don't have. And so trying to figure out what's the right response and what's the right answer uh, is important. There's obviously been, um, in some areas, disproportionate impacts on some communities and vulnerable communities. So, uh, again, when you think about um, managing the whole and pricing risk as a whole, uh, COVID has not been uh, felt proportionally all the, all the same way. Uh, there's been some disproportionate uh, experience there. The good news is that for all customers who have had insurance products uh, up until COVID, uh, those were underwritten. There aren't any exclusions for COVID. And of course, as we started the pandemic, there were a lot of consumers that were really concerned. Was I covered? Will this be met? Uh, what happens if? And so on. Uh, the way obviously insurance works, if you've got the cover, you're covered for what you were covered for uh, at, and the risk was undertaken at the time of underwriting, uh, therefore claims will be paid and you can see those claims uh, based. For new customers, it's not that dissimilar. I mean, people will present complete personal statements um, in talking with some of our members over the last couple of days. There aren't any specific COVID-related questions, uh, but there are a lot of health-related questions that would kind of get to unpack some of those, of those issues. Um, so um, so that, that's the kind of uh, state of play, the underwriting situation. Of course, because we're in a pretty new environment, um, the a key role that we play uh, is around educating the sector. You know, so we ran a really interesting long COVID conversation with a number of senior medical uh, uh, practitioners at our conference late last year. Very happy to share the link to our YouTube on that. Um, but obviously, these are important forums for collaborating, discussing and sharing. Uh, as Professor Tate said in that particular session, you know, there are studies being done all the time uh, globally. So the knowledge base on COVID and long COVID is growing all the time. And so what we might have known six or 12 months ago, you know, more and new knowledge may have come to light, which might actually change how, how things are done. So the education in the sector is important. Education uh, outside of the sector and to the consuming community uh, also really important. Uh, ben spoke a lot about, you know, the wellness and health and wellness and preventative work. Uh, a lot of the life and health sectors have very strong well-being offers, which are really around designed, uh, not just with COVID in mind, but more broadly around uh, preventative health uh, and the link between good health, good diet, exercise, 
and uh, and medical experience is is really at the heart of that idea. Um, uh, that kind of then plays into knowledge, information, and education. Uh, that plays out in that kind of le learning from uh, global experience. Um, in terms of what the future looks like, um, obviously the, ba the pa pan sector discussion on COVID becomes important. There's been a lot of discussion today about supporting people to return to work. That's really at the heart of what uh, many of the life and health players are trying to do. Uh, so someone might be on an income protection claim. Ultimately, it's about helping people to um, underpin their income whilst they can focus on getting better. Um, but and ultimately, uh, you know, most people don't want to stay on claim. They want to get back to their lives. And so uh, obviously insurance is there to support that with a financial lens on. Um, and look, um, of course, it's, uh, it's uh, for all of us, uh, right across this particular part of the community, but the more and more broadly, you know, this is the first pandemic for 100 years. So there's a lot of stuff that we're learning um, and, uh, and knowledge at this point in time is incomplete, but they're very strong global links in terms of how uh, that is playing out. Uh, and so the, the, the FSC has a role to play in kind of connecting those dots uh, locally, also with the community, also with government, but also connecting globally uh, as things play. A lot of the insurance world is reinsured. So these are the big global reinsurers and they play in all jurisdictions. So there's a really strong uh, connectivity there. So with that, uh, Nick, uh, hopefully that shines a little bit of a light on the state of play, uh, a pretty macro conversation. So hopefully that's given some sense of, uh, of where the life and the health insurance sectors play in this particular topic around long COVID and uh, return to work. And with that, I hand it back to you, Nick. Awesome. Thank you so much, Richard. Yeah, yeah, useful, useful insights. And I can see that there's a couple of questions coming through in the chat that I think will likely be relevant to your talk as well. Um, Rochelle, I think you have been um, keeping an eye on the Q&A today. No, it's me, it's me. Oh, it's me. Sarah. <laughs> sorry, Sarah. I no, no, that's all good. Um, <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry, there's lots of there's a flurry of questions coming through at the end. I haven't been sleeping on the job. So um, first question is um, for Tamara. Tamara, do you still have similar test and stay at home policies that you were utilising in March 2022 for your workforce? Yes, we do. So the um, isolation and stay at home requirements are exactly the same. Um, right now, in fact, we've got four people off this week um, in isolation and they are being covered um, their wages or working from home if possible. Um, we will continue to do that um, until we get a bit more information um, about kind of the leave supports payments and, and how long that will be available for and then we'll reassess um, going forward. Great, thank you. Um, so next question, there's a couple of questions actually. One, for Fi and Rachel, um, this is just a yes, no, really. Is it possible to get references around the preference for linear introduction of services within yes, your- Yes, absolutely is. Thank you, yeah. Sarah. We were looking for them um, this morning, but ran out of time. No, um, no, that's all good. We're, we're not expecting you to produce them right now or anything, but you're happy to share those. Absolutely. Lovely. And I've actually got a question for you guys as well. Um, what's been your biggest learning in developing your long COVID service up there in Taranaki? I think one of the big ones for us is at the beginning, it seems like the mountain's just uh, out of view, the summit's out of view, it's too big and hard to climb. So barriers that we initially perceived um, to service links, etc. what we've learned is you can talk, you can negotiate, we all have a voice, people are passionate, uh, particularly in any sector that you're working, um, people want to help people, um, ultimately the community can work together. And so what seems like an impossible task to bring different professions together, different units together, medical staff, nursing staff, allied health staff, or work with, you know, corresponding groups within your um, various areas. It is possible if you say, look, we've got to think things through differently here. The problem's not linear. Previous models with historical knowledge don't necessarily work. You need to be symptom, uh, you need to be solution focused in order to symptom manage the problem. Groundswell works, you can make a significant difference now, but we need funding to do it better. We could do a lot better, we need funding. Yeah, I think that's su such an important message to hear. Yeah, you've got the, the skills, the knowledge, the know-how, the initiative, but it, you can't run that on the smell of an oily rag alongside the existing services, yes, services you that can, you have to provide. You can do quite a lot 
right now though still without the funding yeah. it is tiring but yeah don't don't give up don't win. but you're but a I, superhuman person so <laughs> the team is there's a big team <laughs> your team are yeah um okay thanks so much that's yeah i think you, you make a really important point there fine rachel so thank you for answering that um sort of on that funding and um cost issue i guess because cost is a barrier to healthcare for some Ben, with your service, it's currently being funded for by the MS, MSD, I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, if I'm right, how do you see your service addressing equity issues going forward once that funding is no longer available? Well, sorry, who was that question for, Sarah? That was, was you, it? sorry, Ben, that me. was for you. Okay, you sorry. Like so, uh, yes, so I think that the funding is is a really mixed scenario right so so there has been um various funding and you're quite you're quite right um around whether and how long things will continue for what what i would really encourage is to say that um employers in particular are actually the ones that have the most um to gain here from a fund a little bit and get a whole lot back and you really look after your staff very well and so i would be advocating long term I actually think that a lot of the funding for this will, for our services will need to come from employers rather than from whichever area of government that is paying for it at the time. So there's been a few changes around there. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's without question the return for employers. And that's where I would think it needs to come from. OK, so thank you. Um, Richard, there's been a couple of questions um, that sort of speak to the insurance aspect of things. So. Many health insurance policies exclude a majority of benefits for those with chronic illness, including long COVID. Did you want to comment on this? I know you sort of alluded to that a little bit um, towards the end of your talk. but Yeah, look, there are a couple of uh, really good questions in the chat. Um, obviously, I can't speak on either particular policies or particular companies, but to, to anyone who has a contract with a particular company, I'd certainly encourage them to be in communication and contact with them. Um, you know, our, our duty is to serve and to pay claims where they relevant claims. So uh, that's probably the the broad statement without knowing any of the specifics about the particular cases. So, yeah. Thank you. And I noticed there's a couple of other questions. They're coming in thick and fast now. So um, this is to, to anyone on the panel. Um, as someone living with MECFS for eight years now, I'm wondering if some people with long COVID have a post-viral condition that wouldn't qualify. If they did, they probably wouldn't get back to work full time in eight weeks. And that pressure for them to recover would be impossible. Where's the support for these people? What happens regarding support for these people? Would anyone like to comment on that? Happy just to cover the eight weeks, but if that's a reference to my eight week program, um, that every single uh, time I would I would highlight that we have to take the full context of the individual into account. And so what is an eight week program for somebody may be a six month program for somebody else. And look, we have uh, return to work programs that go over in some rare situations more than 12 or even 24 months. So um we really need to take each individual scenario. And sometimes it is a matter of addressing some factors and, and then getting some improvement and then working out what you then work with next. And that's the important of, importance of the individual understanding their presentation and the providers that are working with them listening and prioritizing um, as a team. Okay, thank you for that. I think I'm just quickly skimming these other questions and I think there is a bit of overlap here so that the general prevailing question from these four questions is around the fact that there's no national coordinated um, pathway or resource sharing. Would anyone like to comment on that in terms of the current situation, what's being done, who should be responsible? It's a big question. Go fire, yep. I feel quite keenly that uh, collaboration is essential and mm. this is an opportunity for private, public, everybody to mm. share. The problem is bigger than Ben Hur, it feels sometimes. And an opportunity is now available for us to work with patients, learn from them, work with previous conditions, learn from them. The, the ebb and flow of the conditions that we see is, is huge and everybody is different. Uh, we're treating long COVID patients every day now. And so it's really important that some kind of cohesive response is done. And I think 
maybe what would be really nice is taking into consideration there's a definite New Zealand focus and a New Zealand context that's really important. Yeah, yeah. But we've got models overseas. We've got countries that are already well into two years now. They're doing reviews of a service that's been developed and redeveloped and reviewed. We could just maybe borrow their service and bring it in and then kind of tweak it as we go with everybody inputting. But it would be a quick kind of fix. I know that sounds incredibly naive and I don't mean it to sound so stupidly, but that could at least kind of get us some support and help those of us who are trying to invent the wheel and really wish we didn't have to. Yeah. I, I feel your frustration, Fi. Thank you. Thank you for that heartfelt response. Would anyone else on the panel like to, to comment? Yes, yeah, Sarah, I, I think that's right. I think I, I think on any major project collaboration will get us so so much further down the track if i think about inside the life and health sectors there's a lot of collaboration going on but you know that's within our sectors um so you know the the question is how do we how do we bring that outside of our sector and connect in with the academic sector and the health sector and so on so uh, you know i think i think if if this forum uh, and conference is a way to connect people, then this is probably a good platform to go forward. Um, so totally endorse bringing people together because, yeah, it's a, it's a combined problem and the combined solutions sit there. And just to that last point, uh, fire raise, which is that, you know, this is a global issue. It's not just a New Zealand issue. And people have been down this path prior to and maybe further down the path. So reinventing the wheel doesn't make a whole lot of sense if we can find where it's working well and, and and make it applicable here in New Zealand. Yeah, I think your point about visibility, Richard's a really important one, that there's lots of people squirreling away doing things, doing great things, but we don't have any sort of connection or cohesiveness in terms of that response, which is not an efficient way for us to be working. I just had a quick comment, Sarah, if I may, and that is that- Absolutely, I, yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I found it, um, frustrating at times because the healthcare system is so under-resourced and wait times to see um, specialists in allied health are really long at the moment and so even though I've got all these sort of connections as an occupational health doctor working in a huge hospital um, you know I'm finding that if I've there are some red flags I'm a bit concerned and I want to rule out you know cardiac pathology people yeah. are still having to wait a really really long time to see a cardiologist so then I'll refer in private and even then they're waiting a really really long time to see anybody in private and it's the same with you know wanting to refer people to a physio with a special interest in long COVID and fatigue management and finding someone suitable and there's there may be tons of them out there but when I've actually gone online and tried to find them I found that really difficult and obviously I've got good health literacy and contacts and things so I think for you know for your average person out there it must be very difficult to access these services and it's disappointing because I sort of thought a year ago that we would have these long COVID clinics set up and it's it just hasn't happened. You're not the only one Nicola. Um, yeah I, I absolutely agree I mean the need for streamlined clear um, effective pathways is is vital and, and joining the dots between the different people that are involved in the care of, of patients and it's just really fragmented at, at present. Um, I think we're probably at time. So thank you so much, panel, for your contribution. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed this session. I've learned an enormous amount and have got lo lots of food for thought. Um, so we're going to take a mini break and we are going to resume with session six at 20 past three. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone.